Hello, hello, my name is Ten, and today I'll be teaching you how to speedrun a random seed in Muck. I will be making this tutorial under the assumption that you've never played Muck before, even casually. And I'll only be covering the uh, quote-unquote main way to complete a run. There are dozens of different things that can happen and different things that you can do, and they all have various trade-offs. Uh, so covering everything would take hours. So we'll just stick to what is considered the, the easiest and the main way that we can complete a run. If you've played Muck before, please take a look at the timestamps and chapters of the video. Uh, skip around to where you need to start learning. Well, let's get into it. All right, first things first, we're going to need to download the game. Head over to Steam, download the whopping 403 megabytes to begin your speedrunning dreams. Next, we'll want to grab some sort of timer. Uh, we can either use Live Split, which you may already have if you speedrun in the past, or even easier, we can use the in game timer which will automatically time your runs without worrying about restarting manually every time you reset. The next thing is optional, but you may want to download a macro tool if you want to reset the game hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, you can automate the reset so it happens nearly instantly and saves you a lot of time. Uh, most runners will use auto hotkey as there's already a pre-made macro for resetting the game on speedrun.com, but I personally use Keyran. I make my own macros for resetting muck and I can do it easily uh, for set seeds, random seed or anything like that. So just whatever you prefer is what will work for you. Obviously you'll want to have some sort of recording software, OBS, LOBS, NVIDIA, Twitch software, whatever floats your boat, as long as you're comfortable with it and it can capture game audio and the video. The last thing you want is a copy of the material list on hand. Uh, we'll go over this later, but to finish the game, we need to repair a boat and each part requires certain resources. While you're learning the speedrun, having the number of materials you need handy will ensure you're not missing anything when you go to finish the game. As far as the setup goes, we're all done. Launch the game, hit record, and let's get going. As I mentioned before, we'll be learning how to run the random seed category. If you're familiar with Minecraft at all, this game also has random procedurally generated islands that are all unique with over 8 billion possible islands that can be created. There aren't many rules for speedrunning Muck, but we do have to make sure the version of the game is visible in the top left. Uh, and the entire settings panel on the right is visible, so we need to see that the seed is empty, nothing typed in here. Uh, the game mode is set to survival, and the difficulty doesn't matter, but generally, generally you'll want to play on easy. As long as all that stuff is visible, you're good. And then in terms of in the game, we need to make sure the top left of the screen and the bottom left of the screen are visible, as information pops up there that is used in verifying runs. The bottom and top middle of the screen, as well as the middle right, are generally good places to put your webcam, timer, or input display. Um, if you're just using input display, bottom middle is usually a pretty good spot. As you can see where that's what I have mine at. The last rule is that you have to show the seed of your current run if you do finish and want to submit a run. Um, so if I, if I don't do a seed in here, it will start a game with a random seed, and I'll load in and assume I finish the game. I'm gonna click enter to bring up the chat box and you wanna type forward slash seed. And it has to be lowercase. I don't know why it works that way, uh, but that will show the seed and that will show the mods what they need to see for verifying your run. So generally what happens is you'll beat the final boss and people will freak out and just type slash seed while they're waiting for the final boss animation to play out. All right, let's talk about settings real quick. Uh, go to the settings tab here. We'll wanna turn off camera shake grass and tutorial those will just uh, be distracting get in the way and under the graphics tab I suggest we turn off bloom and motion blur uh, those are technically optional but just uh, quality of life things that will help you in the long run uh, the last thing we'll talk about is FOV FOV stands for field of view and essentially what it's going to control is how much of the world you can see on the left and right side or like your peripherals so I'm going to load in the same exact seed with two different settings just to show you the difference a 95, which I believe is the default FOV. So as I load in, the first thing I'm doing as, an, as a runner is looking around and taking note of the things I see. There are places called villages, which are the most important things to see. And if, if I'm looking around quick glance, I'm not seeing anything. This, on the left side of the screen, I can see something. It's a building, I can tell it's a building, that's it. Um, otherwise, I don't see a whole lot. There's nothing here. I would probably just reset this, uh, maybe move around a little bit, whatever. We go back and change our FOV to max, which is what I play on. Load into the same exact seat. And now that we can see more on the edges of our screen, while I'm looking at where I know that building was right here, 
on the edge of my screen now i see this structure here uh as we'll go over later we i know that this is a little pavilion which indicates that this actually is a village so while it may not matter to most people for me personally uh, i like the high of v because i can see things really far away and i can identify them quickly so with a high fov i'm actually going to run this seed i would start the seed at least because i know for a fact there's a village here on 95 fov i can't see that pavilion so you can still run to this and it would still be a village obviously but when you're doing hundreds and thousands of runs you have to be pretty picky so that's really the difference in fov most runners play on 95 or default i think i'm the only person at least that i know of that plays on max uh, play around with it yourself my only suggestion is to find what you like and stick with it if i try to play this game on 95 nowadays it is incredibly difficult to me the game feels entirely different and it's just super super weird so uh this tutorial will be in 120 you pick what you want to do everything is still going to apply the same either way it doesn't actually change anything just how the game feels now that we're getting into the actual game let's go over the absolute basics the lower right side of the screen over here we'll see our stats the top red bar is our health the middle yellow bars are hunger the bottom pink bars are stamina hunger is only important if it's empty because if it's empty our stamina will not regenerate health is pretty self-explanatory just don't lose it all and stamina is its own separate thing that we have to master uh, 75 percent of the movement in this game is based entirely on your stamina so uh we're gonna cover stamina pretty in depth here while we're walking and standing still obviously our stamina is not going to get drained uh holding shift to sprint does cause our stamina to steadily drain and jumping whether we're sprinting moving or standing still will cause a chunk of stamina to drain if you notice if i've sprint jumping that my stamina will drain while i'm in the air even though i'm not sprinting so the game thinks i'm sprinting on the ground but i'm not so the key is going to be to release shift while you're in the air so that way we're not draining unnecessary stamina it's going to look something like this you can keep an eye on the uh, input display there to help visualize it so i'm going to be sprinting jump and let go shift almost immediately and that's how you're going to end up moving around the reason why letting go of shift in the air is so important is because bunny hopping is the most important movement tech in the game uh, like in many other games bunny hopping is the fastest way to move around without assistance and it's pretty easy to learn but very difficult to master in muck i'm going to try to walk you through how to learn bunny hopping um again keep an eye on the input display there hopefully that will help some of you uh so first of all you want to practice just jumping while letting go of shift because that's kind of an unnatural motion because most games don't have that weird stamina drain in the air so hold shift jump and then let go of shift and just hold space so that every time you hit the ground you're jumping and once you have a uh, once you get comfortable doing that we're going to start implementing uh diagonal movement here let's just say i need to travel to this this tree right here i'm going to need to hold a diagonal so w a or w d and i need to hold the diagonal in the opposite direction that i'm facing so i'm going here i'm going to look to the right but i'm going to hold w a which is like the left diagonal and that's going to not necessarily add our straight ahead and left momentum together but it does a weird movement thing that nobody really completely understands and it's going to make us go faster so practice doing the shift jump and letting go of shift and then just holding your diagonal and we'll do the same thing going back but looking left and holding wd as you can see our stamina is preserved much more and we go quite a bit faster what i suggest is you find this a little valley kind of like this and just practice going back and forth with your diagonal jumps and then once you're comfortable with that start switching your diagonals in between everything so we'll go left and then we'll go right left and right and this is good practice because while you're doing bunny hops in an actual run you'll be changing directions pretty constantly the last thing we'll add to our bunny hops is a little flick uh you'll see a lot of or most top runners do this pretty much every runner actually uh, as i jump i'm gonna be doing like a little mouse flick the movement's so small that the input display doesn't even pick it up and all i'm doing is moving my camera into the direction of where i want to go so if i again want to go to this tree here i'm going to hold my diagonal bunny hop but every time i hit the ground i'm going to be doing a little flick so again facing right holding left diagonal 
We're gonna bunny hop, and every time we hit the ground, I'm flicking to the left a little bit towards that tree. And if I switch directions, I'm gonna flick towards the tree. Uh, the flick part itself is kind of unknown if it's necessary. The main thing is obviously going to be controlling the direction in which you go, which can be achieved by just kind of looking in the direction. But it's something about that flick that feels different. It's it's really hard to explain, which is why you have to kind of figure it out yourself. Just try doing a flick. Try not doing the flick. See what feels right to you. Uh, I, I've been doing a flick for the entire time I've run this game. So that's what I suggest you do. It's just the way everybody has learned and nobody knows any different at this point. The last little tidbits about stamina are kind of confusing. Uh, the important part of the stamina bar is actually the very end, the leftmost end. There's like an imaginary line or a number that once you reach it, your next jump is actually not going to have enough stamina to be a real jump. It's very confusing to hear it and to say out loud, actually. Um, it's one of those things you have to play around with yourself. So let's go down this hill. We're going to have some good momentum from our bunny hops here. Once we reach this line right here, it looks like we have plenty of stamina to do a jump. But if I'm correct, this next jump will actually essentially have no momentum and will cause us to stop. Uh, so I'm going to resume, hold my diagonal, hold space. And you see right there how I lost almost my entire horizontal momentum. Uh, again, it's just an imaginary number, imaginary line. It makes no sense. And it constantly changes based on like your power ups. So if I get a stamina boost power up, then this line is no longer the exact same space. Uh, so play around with it yourself. Get a feel for the end of that stamina bar and know when you have to just not jump that's what that's what you do to solve it you get to the end of your stamina bar and all you do is stop jumping one jump early so right here i'm not going to jump because if i know if i jump i'm going to slow down and it's better to land and regain stamina than it is to try to get the extra jump in the very last thing about stamina is swimming uh, swimming is the fastest normal mode of transportation just hold space and forward and or diagonal and you move actually pretty quickly uh, as long as there's not ground high enough to like trip you up even if you have no stamina you're still going pretty fast uh, you do start to drown a little bit so that's kind of a bummer and the only other thing is when you start to reach the coast if you're out of stamina once you're sh once the water is shallow enough for you to hit the ground you'll do a jump if you're holding space and it's gonna be one of those pathetic jumps and you'll be not regaining stamina for however long you're in the air which doesn't seem like a lot but it's just a little uh, minute details you can uh, think about while you're running so if I'm coming up to the edge here and I'm going to run out of stamina I'm actually going to let go of space that way I start regaining the stamina the second I hit the ground so I'm going to let go probably right now I start to regain stamina instantly and then I can do a diagonal jump to get out of water quickly if I don't do that and I come over here to this beach and I hold space I do a jump and then I'm like stuck in the water for an extra and I try to jump, but I don't have the stamina to jump. So you're kind of flounder. One of those things you should play around with, get a feel for yourself. It'll make sense once you start to do it a few times. All right, let's go over our inventory. If we press tab, it brings up our inventory screen. It's very similar to any kind of survival game like Minecraft. Uh, we've got our armor slots up in the top left, a shield slot, even though shields don't exist in the game and arrows. Uh, we won't be going over arrows because it's a very rare circumstance that you'll be able to actually use them. Uh, so it's just not worth going over at the moment. Um, we've got our main three rows of inventory here. And then the bottom row is actually like our one through seven hot bar. So any item we press, uh, we place down in the hot bar, we can press the corresponding number to bring that item up and like hold it in our hands. Uh, each individual stack can hold up to 69 items, which is pretty nice if you ask me. Uh, with exceptions for like one of a kind items like the gems and stuff like that. You will have to manually place items into your hotbar. Uh, I believe in Minecraft you can shift click things to move them or you can click the number to move them. In this game that does not work. So you will have to click and then click again to move the item into your hotbar. Um, my only suggestion for hotbars is to make sure you put the same item in the same slot every run. So we'll go over a technique later called quick switching. But I want an, a weapon in slot 2. I need to be able to always like feel comfortable using two as my quick switch uh, slot. So once you get the hang of the game, make sure you're putting things in the same slot every time so that your muscle memory can take over and you can always do things the right way. If we open any of the green chests, uh, it's going to open up the chest inventory on top of our own inventory here. 
uh, just like in Minecraft, we can actually hold left shift and left click and the items will enter our, the first open slot in our inventory. This will always be the fastest option for gathering things from chests with one strange exception, which we'll go over later. Uh, there are only a few items that can spawn in chests that we don't ever need, such as like walls or um, like food ingredients. If you can figure it out right away that you don't need something, obviously just don't left click on that. But if you're just learning, it's good practice to go into a chest and just grab everything as fast as you can to try to get the hang of how the menus work and the speed at which your you know your sensitivity is. So practice just grabbing grabbing all the items and then you can get rid of them as we're going. So I know I don't need these walls. We'll just drop the walls. Speaking of our armor slots, uh, unlike Minecraft, we cannot shift click any of our armor into our armor slots. We actually have to manually uh, move things to the correct location. So just take that into account. If you do happen to pick up some armor, you got to put it in there manually. My last little tip about the inventory is that there are three items, the raw meat, the flour, uh, flax or wheat that you have to collect a certain amount of every run. And these are the three things that you generally don't buy from any of the, the sellers, which again, we'll go over later. I personally like to put these in the last three spots of my hot bar because they're slots that I will never actually use to quick switch because they're so far away, but it allows me to keep an eye on the amount of each item I have at a quick glance. So I don't have to always go into my inventory and block my screen. And if you just noticed right there, uh, the last little gimmick about the inventory is you can actually move around while you're in your inventory and holding the direction keys actually moves you. So you can basically move around as long as your camera's not moving. So uh, one tip you're gonna wanna keep in mind is try to do your inventory management while you're moving. So I grabbed this uh, four piece here. If I'm going towards the boat, I can drop this while I'm moving and it will stay back there. And I can do pretty much anything else while I'm going. So get used to moving and moving stuff around in your inventory or, you know, just learn to drop things. All you have to do is click and then click off of your inventory, or I can pick things up and tab out of my inventory. We'll also drop them. Uh, you'll get used to it. Just remember that you can move and inventory at the same time. I mentioned previously that there was one strange item that had a uh, strange behaviors as far as the inventory goes, and that would be the boat map. The boat map appears in the very first green chest you check in a new seed. And then we'll ch it will appear in every other green uh, chest you check until you activate the boat map. So you see here, we don't know where the boat is on our map. I'm gonna going to come here and activate the map, but shift clicking like normal does not activate the map. You see, we don't have the, the boat marker and it didn't give us the message in the bottom left. The boat map is so strange. Um, you have to either move it to a different location in your inventory. You have to move a different item in your inventory while the boat map is in your inventory, or you can manually place the boat map into your inventory. I'll demonstrate all three different varieties just to show you how to do it quickly, I guess. Uh, this one will do moving a different item so you can see we adjusted a, an item in our inventory and now the boat map has activated. And here's the method I know Zaffy does. He grabs everything very quickly. And as he's leaving whatever green chest he opens, he will move the boat map one space and then discard it like that. Again, moving something in your inventory just happens to be the boat map. If it's the only item in your inventory, it works. So I didn't need this mithril here. And then the strategy I use is the click and then uh, drag in manually. And then I just put it right back into the chest. So I just do this and do that. All three methods work. They all have their own little quirks. They're, you know, if one's faster, it's by fractions of a second. So don't worry about it too much. Just do whatever feels right. The key is you don't want to just shift click it into your inventory and forget about it. And then not have the boat up when you sh when you should know where it is and be checking how far away you are. So I just mentioned uh, a technique called quick switching, and that's what we're going to go over here real quick. Quick switching or quick hitting you might recognize from other speed runs. Uh, the process of swinging uh, a, a tool or a weapon, switching off of the weapon with your quick your hot bar and then switching back onto it quickly. So that way you're not having the, the animation of the swing and you reset it so you can start the swing again quicker. So if I'm just holding space, uh, holding left click, you can see how slow this regular axe 
uh, is the wood X. If I start quick switching, there's a very noticeable increase in attack speed, which is important for weapons uh, and for uh, looting villages. Same works for pickaxes. As you can see, if I just hold left, it's far slower than doing quick switches. I suggest you load into a survival seed to practice. Uh, going into creative makes you do like infinite damage, so you can't actually, you know, practice on resources. So pickaxe is obviously for rocks, axes for trees. There's a certain rhythm to it that you'll eventually get down. Uh, you can definitely go too fast because if you go too fast, you can either do zero, like just completely not have a hit. So you see there, I did zero damage. Uh, as I was saying, you can go too fast. If you frame perfectly switch, you actually do the amount of damage you would do with the item you're switching off of. So you just learn that rhythm, switch too fast, you'll do a zero. Um, switch too fast, you also just might not do any damage. So definitely practice quick switching. I would suggest you start with rocks, wood axe, and wood pick. Those are like the main things you'll start with every run that are definitely noticeably faster when you quick switch. So it's easier to get a feel for it. Uh, even up to like an Addy axe or an Addy pickaxe are good practice tools because they are still somehow faster to quick switch with. And then the other main thing is a chief spear. If you can either craft one or find one by luck or get into a creative mode, like you have to use a mod for this. Uh, for this little menu here. But quick switching with this weapon is very important because it's the strongest in the game. But if you just hold left click, it's very slow. So learning to quick switch will increase your DPS a ton. Uh, the things you don't want to quick switch with are things like regular swords that always attack fast enough where quick switching actually slows you down. Especially the Addy, which is the one you'll use the most. Now that we know most of our basics, movements and stuff like that, Let's go over how to actually beat the game. The goal of each run is to collect all of the materials needed to repair the boat, uh, which includes killing all five of the gem guardians to place their gems in these slots. Then we're going to defeat the final boss, which is uh, the dragon named Bob. This shows you all of the raw materials and items that we need to actually fix the boat and beat the game. Uh, this doesn't obviously include items that we would craft from these, but it does show you exactly how many things we do have to make sure we get and get the right number, which is why I suggested at the beginning to make sure you have the material list ready, um, which will again will be in the description. It also shows you just how much of your inventory it takes up. So if we have a thing like a weapon, an axe, a pickaxe and some food, we really cut our inventory space close. So keep in mind not to carry extra things that we don't need and to craft as soon as we can to free up some space. You might be thinking, damn, that's a lot of items. How is the world record under 12 minutes for random seed? Uh, the most important RNG in the game is coming up next, and that's going to be trading outposts. Trading outposts, or what I call villages, house NPCs that will sell you a wide array of items. All but seven items needed to repair the boat can be sold by various NPCs here, uh, depending on the RNG of the seed. So our main goal is to have enough money to trade for everything we need and then hopefully pick up all of the item things while killing guardians and other bosses. Villages are very easy to distinguish uh, from all the other parts of the world, and you're going to want to keep an eye out for a few things to know if you've got a village to go check out. Pavilions only spawn in villages. So if you see these off in the distance with no walls, you know there's a village there. The other things that only spawn in villages include log piles, rock piles, barrels, campfires, logs laying down by themselves, obviously the NPCs or the villagers, and a special type of chest called the chief chest, which is always going to be on like a stone platform like this. You can see most of this from a distance, especially with high FOV. Uh, the smoke from the fires is a very easy way to see things like perhaps if a village is behind this hill, I can see, you could in theory see smoke from behind it and know that there's a village to go visit back back there. There are plenty of ways to identify a village, so just get used to what's here because these things can only occur in a village, so it's easy to know when you've got a place to go. Let's cover the main aspects of each village, the types of loot we can get, the types of traders there are, and the chief chest. The looting path of a village is going to be different based on the shape of the village. Uh, an average village can be expected to be kind of a circle. So we'll take this for example. It's a, an elongated circle, but it's mostly a circle. So we'll choose one point. So say we come from this direction over here. 
choose one point and then we'll kind of just travel in a circle getting all the loot and checking all the trades as we go the key is not to waste your time going back and forth between things so if you come from this direction i don't want to be doing this and then this and then this and then this so if get a path and go uh, sometimes villages will spawn in more of a line it's hard to see with all the trees here it's kind of just a line up this hill here uh, in that case you would want to make sure you hit everything with ways on your way up or down so as you're playing you'll get used to all these different kind of villages um that's all rng so it's not like it's a guarantee thing just make sure you check everything out villagers can spawn inside the huts on accident chief chest can spawn in weird spots it's all random and it's only stuff you can figure out by experiencing it yourself so speaking of villagers there are six types of villagers that can spawn at any village it's all rng it will not always be the same will not always have the same trades uh, i'll be using my terminology throughout the rest of the tutorial but you can call these guys whatever you like uh, first off we've got the archer the archer doesn't tend to sell anything we care about uh, they can sell flowers they can sell bows and arrows as you see here you can buy flowers if you have the extra gold but it's usually pretty easy to collect them as you are going through your run uh, bows and arrows only really matter on runs where you have tons of extra gold and even then it's only certain bows certain arrows uh, again we won't be going over that because it's so niche and so rare that it'll actually you know make sense to buy them chefs or food guys are next they sell food but we really only care about two types of food and that would be pink soup which this guy does not have and weird soup which this guy also doesn't have uh, pink soup only restores stamina and it's relatively cheap per consumption uh, and then weird soup is a backup it does a little bit of every stat but it is more expensive so generally if we're going to buy a bunch of food for the run we're going to buy pink soups uh, they can randomly sell wood and wheat so if you don't have regular wood in any of your trades and you are desperate come look at a, a food guy and he might hook you up next up is the woodcutter or wood guy uh the wood guy sells woods he also sells axes uh but generally we're only looking at the type of wood he sells we've got regular wood which is just called wood uh birch wood fir oak and dark oak so we've got five types of wood total in the game that we need to collect uh when we check these wood guy trades basically we're just making sure that there are five different types of wood because that guarantees that we've got all the wood that we need next up we've got the smith or as i call them the iron guys the uh, main things we care about with iron guys are adamantite ore obamium ore rubies and swords uh in a pinch you can also purchase iron ore from these guys if they sell it uh but it's rare that you'll have to do that in single player we'll be purchasing purchasing both addy ore and obamium ore one of each which will be five of each ore and then we'll buy 15 rubies because that's how many we have to buy and then we'll most likely be buying an adamantite sword from smith traders if they sell them the last type of trader is called the wild card or white pants white pants can sell literally any other item that any of the other traders could sell but it's completely random so as we can see this white pants sells addy some bows lightning arrows and bowls this is a pretty useless white pants uh addy is obviously the only thing we would care about here i've seen white pants with every single ore including rubies uh all of the different woods and then something like this where it's almost nothing um, generally they're used for like filling in gaps where other traders don't have things but they're just another trader if they sell what you need then then perfect it's not like it's any different than buying from a different trader the final village npc is the runner these guys are just literally guys that run around you can't trade with them you can't speak with them can't interact with them in any way uh but they just run they'll run in a straight line they'll pause they'll run again they can face through buildings they can face through objects uh and they will make you accidentally hit them while you're doing things around the village it's important to keep track of runners because if you're using a tool or a weapon out in the village uh, and you hit one of them it could cause the village to become angry at you and then the village is no longer useful to trade with so i said hitting the villager will make them upset uh just for example if you do zero damage they actually won't do anything but anything that you swing at them that, that causes a damage will cause all the villagers to become angry at you they will attack you and then i can no longer trade with them as you can see i'm trying to interact with them and it doesn't work so that's why we'd be careful with runners uh, obviously careful with all the other traders all the other npcs the last and arguably most important part of the village is the chief chest the special chest that's on the pedestal 
there's only one chief chest per village in the game's code at least um they can spawn close enough to water and for some reason when the chief chest spawns in water it just disappears so if you think you're going crazy because there's no chief chest but you're by water that's probably what happened opening this chest if i walk up and click e and open it it will also cause the villagers to become upset and i will essentially ruin the village there's a weird workaround though where if we break the chest that won't happen we'll still get all the contents but it won't make them upset uh, now breaking a chief chest is pretty finicky there's a very specific location you need to be uh, to make contact and it all depends on like the slope the chest is on and a lot of other factors that nobody really understands you generally want to stand behind that's where it seems like the hitbox is largest you don't want to stand too close you don't want to stand too far away there's like a weird middle ground perfect example of how finicky this really can be so I'm standing in the in this very precise location um you can use rocks to do it quick switch with the rocks it doesn't do as much damage as you know using an axe and axes are far faster uh worst comes to worst you use a rock but generally once you reach the the chief chest if you have an axe you're going to want to break it uh you'll learn more about that as you do runs and you'll get a feel for when's the appropriate time to do it sometimes you'll even open a chest like if this village has nothing of use that guy doesn't sell anything good the wood guys don't sell anything i can just come take this chest and hope that it has a good item like a weapon and then we'll just go from there uh, once you've spent a few hundred hours in this game finding the sweet spot in the chest isn't that bad as you can see i can just kind of walk up and grab it you get a feel for it it's not the same every time so if like the slope is too steep it may actually be easier to hit from the front uh, it's very strange when they're on slopes uh it's harder to do because you actually move down slopes they're like pixels at a time i'll do a little time lapse here of me just slowly sliding down the slope so that little drift of pixels can actually take you out of the the correct area to hit the chest uh so just keep that in mind sometimes you'll have to just tap s to go backwards into the the correct spot uh, and then the only only other thing to note on chief chest is every chest in every chief chest in the this seed will have the exact same contents so the other one had what iron bars gold rock and bread they'll be different amounts but it will always have gold bread iron bars i didn't have rock apparently there are three villages on each island and each one of them will have the same exact items in the chief chest so if you know it's a, a dud don't break another chief chest if you know it's great you may want to find another village and grab that chief chest immediately now that we know how to utilize villages let's figure out how we're going to get the money you need to make those trades uh these are boss statues there are four main bosses that you'll be fighting in a run and we're going to go over their attack patterns and how to defeat them easily first we have the big chunk he's very slow he only has one move that's even a little bit dangerous to us it's important to try to beat at least one of these in each run they drop rocks which are a really valuable resource and one that we need the most of to repair the ship to kill the chunk all we do is stand between his legs and look up and we're just going to jump while we swing our sword so i'm just going to be holding jump and swinging the sword uh, this causes us to actually hit a multitude of hitboxes in his legs so we'll be doing like five or six times damage per swing uh, you'll see that indicated by all the numbers that'll be popping up around him he does have three attacks uh his first attack is like a rock throw the reach back throw a rock at us and it's pretty easy to dodge uh, even if it does hit us it barely hurts uh second attack is very similar to the first but he doesn't throw a rock he just reach reaches back and then swings his arm forward and hits the ground um you really will never get hit by this because he can't hit directly underneath him the third one that is actually a little bit scary is a uh like a ground slam he'll slowly start to squat down He'll jump up and then slam down on the ground causing impact damage while also shooting rocks out in every direction the rocks can also hit you if you're underneath them so it's common to take massive damage from this attack it's partially avoidable by jumping to meet him as he comes down from his jump then mashing jump to try to like jump off of a part of his body which will keep you out of range of the rocks so you'll take damage from the impact but not from the rocks very rarely you can avoid all damage from this but i i don't even think i've ever done that just try to avoid the rock damage you'll generally only see one or two attacks per kill because it's pretty pretty simple uh, i'll try to walk uh talk through the attacks as they're happening again just watch what i'm doing is pretty simple he spawns he's doing a squat attack now 
So I'm going to jump to meet him and spam jump. I, I did not take damage from all those rocks. I only took damage from the slam. Uh, so I'm just going to jump. He's doing another squat. So I'm going to wait, jump. But you can see how many times I'm actually hitting him per swing. And that was chunk. I took damage on purpose and we still, you know, we're still alive. Uh, as a final note, rock enemies, including the big chunks, take special damage from pickaxes. So they're like the one boss you can kill easily with a wood pickaxe if that's all you have and you need the money. Uh, it's the same exact technique, except while you're jumping, you need to also quick switch, which is a little bit more difficult, but with practice, it's pretty simple. You'll die very quickly uh, either way, but sword will always be faster. So if you have a choice of sword, use the sword. Our second boss is the chief. Chiefs have four attacks, and while they're not as avoidable as Chunk, uh, it's still really easy to take care of these guys. His first attack is going to be just a straight-up spear, like, slash. So just slash the spear down in front of him. All you have to do is step out of the way. Uh, second is going to be a spear throw, and it's just as avoidable. He will charge up by pulling his arm back, and then he'll throw a spear at you. As long as you're strafing, you're going to be fine. Uh, if that spear does hit you, it does not do a whole ton of damage. Uh, third is his jump attack. Uh, this attack happens more often if you're further away from him because he uses it to kind of bridge the gap between you two. Uh, he'll launch himself at you, slamming the ground and causing impact damage. All you have to do is try to like force the target to, to miss you. Uh, the target works based on your momentum, so it'll try to predict that if I walk this way, by the time I hit here, he'll be able to hit me. So just, you know, just move to the side. It's it's pretty simple. It's hard to explain, but once you see it in action, it's pretty. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, last is his whirlwind attack. It's the only one that can really do damage to us because of a glitch. Uh, he will do a little audio cue, like charge up thing, and then he'll start spinning around in circles with his spear. Uh, the easiest way for me to avoid that is to just hold jump. So I'm jumping while it happens, and I can still hit him the entire time. The only problem with this man, a move, is if you kill him while he's doing it, a lot of the time his area of effect will stay on the ground so the spear whirlwind will still be there and while you're waiting for his items to come down you'll be taking a ton of damage i'll try to showcase that but if it doesn't happen just know that it can happen and it has killed my runs before if you're not paying attention so there we go there's the spear slash all we do is step to the sign again there's a jump so i'm i'm close to him so i can either move out of the way or jump uh, here's his whirlwind. I can just jump. Pretty easy. Now we'll wait for him to do another whirlwind so I can kill him during it. Uh, ooh, we need to wait for a spear throw as well. Could you please throw your spear at me, sir? All right, there it is. I wasn't strafing, but all you have to do is strafe out of the way. Uh, so now I'll wait for him to do a whirlwind so I can show you that it stays on the ground after you kill him a lot of the times. All right. See right there? It stays on the ground. It didn't do any damage to me this time, but if you kill him at the wrong time, it does stay for a while and can do a lot of damage. Next up, we have the Gronk. By far the most dangerous of our bosses. Uh, he's pretty capable of killing you in one attack if you're not careful. His first attack is just sword slashes. He'll just reach in front of him, slash the sword a few times. Um, when he spawns, you will always attack with this first as long as you stay within range. He just swings the swords and causes massive damage. To dodge this, all we have to do is walk behind him as he's winding up. But we have to be careful because the hitbox of his swords actually extends backwards beyond where he is. Uh, hard to explain, but I'll show you what I mean when I spawn him. So just avoid it. Keep swinging. You'll hit him and he won't be able to hit you. Another attack he does is a sword throw where he just winds up and throws each of his swords at you. Again, just another attack we can dodge by strafing. The last attack he does is like a ground slam charge attack. He will charge up a little bit and slam the ground and shoot beams of light across the ground and in a lot of directions. Uh, when we hear the charge, all we have to do is back up a little bit. He slams and we jump over the beam and we can go right back to attacking him. Uh, he's very simple, just like all the other bosses, but he's just dangerous if you're not careful. So I'll spawn him. I'll try to show you the weird hitbox thing. So his first attack will always be this. So if I get too close, he can actually, you saw I just got hit from behind. Most of the time he'll do two, not all the time. It's not a guarantee he'll do two of those in a row. All right, here's the sword throw. So we just strafe that one. 
more of that. Sword throw, we just strafe it. Wait until he does a, a ground slam here. Oh, here's a sword throw again. There we go. Charge up, we back up and jump. All we have to do is avoid those and we can go right back to killing them. All right, the last of our boss statues are the five gem guardians. These are placed randomly around the map. We can only find them by getting the gem map over at the boat. They're not as easy to kill as the chunks, but with a little practice, they're they're just big pushovers. The first attack is just a simple swipe of their arms in front. You just easy uh, to dodge, you sidestep it. It's pretty quick, but once you know what is coming, you just kind of move to the side. Uh, second attack is a ground slam plus an explosion for lack of a better description. You will leap into the air, slam down into the ground while creating a target on the ground where a small explosion will happen. Uh, the target is placed based on our momentum. So if we're moving this way and he does the slam, the target will appear here because when it detonates, we'll be on top of that. So to bait that target, all we have to do, wait for him to go up and then move to the side, but we sprint. So if we sprint while the target's being generated, it'll go over there because it thinks we're gonna sprint over there. But all we have to do is do it for a second stop and it will miss and then we can just go back to attacking him. Uh, it'll make more sense once you see it in action. Last is the energy beam attack. The Guardian will slowly charge up, then he'll blast us with an energy beam that lasts several seconds. Uh, it's an intimidating attack casually, but it's actually kind of coded backwards in a way. The further away we are from the Guardian, the more damage the beam will do. So what we need to do is hug the Guardian as closely as possible. Um, once you hear him charge, just get close, keep attacking him, um, and you'll usually not negate every single bit of damage but if you get the sweet spot you'll actually take zero damage from it uh, and if you happen to have any piece of gear literally anything at all it will almost always negate all the damage so if i have gold boots on and i can i can stand here and keep attacking him and take zero damage from the beam it's very strange i don't know why the armor works that way with the beam specifically but if you do find a piece of armor make sure you put it on because it's actually helpful let me see if i can demonstrate all these attacks for you Okay, here's this beam attack. We're gonna get very close, keep attacking, hold W. It seems like I took a lot of damage, but that's significantly reduced. So he jumps, I bait out the target that way. Try to do it, uh, here's a beam. So I'll go a little farther away. This might actually backfire. Oh my gosh. Okay, yep. See, I took a lot more damage there. He jumps, I'm just baiting that target out that way. I just wanna see his swipe attack before I kill him. While you're fighting them, just just keep strafing because that swipe attack is uh, it does come out pretty fast like that. There's really not a lot of warning, uh, and that's guardian. I mean, it's like I said, it's pretty simple. Make sure you get these gems. They're easy to miss because they fly high in the air sometimes. On the map, though, if you look, the gem actually shows up here. So as I'm leaving a guardian, sometimes I'll just click the map to check, and I'll see that, and I can go back and get it real quick. So that's all of the bosses. I actually killed an extra chief on accident. And of course, while recording the tutorial, got the super rare drop of a chief spear. Uh, so I'll just demonstrate why this is the best on a chunk. So again, uh, chief spear is great, super rare. Only difference to killing all the bosses, you have to quick switch while you're doing it but it does massive damage and you can kill most bosses in like three or four swings, especially depending on your power-ups. Overall, these fights are all super simple once you learn their attack patterns and how to dodge them. They're only really dangerous if you get too cocky and try to kill them while you're too low health and try to tank an attack that you just don't have the health for. The second to last thing we're gonna learn about before learning how to do an actual run are the different types of structures that can spawn in the world. Wooden carts, or uh, as I like to call them, wagons, look exactly like this. They can spawn with one, two, or three chests in them, but they can all be accessed from one side, so you don't have to worry about walking around them. These are generally not worth looting unless they're directly in your path, or if you need a chest at the start of the run to get a boat map. The unique structure in villages, uh, the pavilions, will have one or two chests along the side, uh, which lead up to a set of two barrels. These chests are generally useful to look into, uh, especially early in a run. They can contain wood, axes, or picks, rocks, wood, wheat, iron bars, and a few other materials that we will need. I suggest you start by looting the chests then moving up to break the barrels. This way you have a chance to loot an axe and speed up your chopping. 
if you enter a second village and you're in really good shape in the run, it may not be worth your time to loot these chests, especially since they generally only contain the easier to obtain stuff. But you'll get a feel for all of that, uh, whether or not you should be looting these additional villages. Whatever you do, don't break the barrels in the second village. They're almost never worth it. They only generally drop iron ore, bread, wheat, and money, all of which you should have completely covered by the time you make it to a second village. Caves are incredibly hit or miss in a run. They can definitely be useful early on in the run. They have a 40% chance each of having raw meat and iron ore in one of their chests, a 5% chance to have adamantite ore, a 1% chance to have obamium ore, and even a 0.1% chance to have either the Gronk sword or a knight blade. Once you've reached a village and done your trades, entering another cave is almost always going to be a waste of time. Assuming you have all your trades done, you won't need any of the ores that we can get from here, and we won't want to waste time on a slim chance of a better weapon. My suggestion is to enter caves early in the run if they're nearby, but if it's not the beginning of your run or they're far away, don't take the time to go to one. The two types of statues we haven't talked about yet are the respawn totem and the battle totem. Respawn totems are pretty obvious uh, we won't utilize them in a single player run, but if you do any co-op stuff, it takes 20 gold to respawn your teammate exactly where they died. Totems, on the other hand, are something you may utilize. Uh, when you activate a totem, it will spawn three enemies of a random type, and that type will be chosen at random based on the number of days you've been on the seed. So the more days you've been alive, the harder the enemies are allowed to be chosen. Uh, once you defeat the three enemies, the totem will disappear and leave you with a random power-up. Uh, like caves, these are, these are also going to be a mostly early game option for you. On day 0 and 1, you are most likely to spawn the little dinosaur guys, the green goblins, the rock dudes, or the wolves. All of these are relatively easy to defeat, even with beginner uh, weapons or tools. So if you're desperate for some extra money to trade for a sword or an ore, these are a viable option. The rest of the structures are the various types of huts that can spawn anywhere on the island, either by themselves or as part of a village as we see here. Each hut will have a distinctive workbench on the outside on the left, so knowing what you're looking at from a distance is relatively easy uh, and also helpful in a speedrun, especially since there's no guarantee for any number of each of these huts in, the, in a seed. First off, we have the Jack Hut. The most common type of hut, it's designated by a plain workbench outside. Uh, jack hut chests usually contain simple materials such as early game woods, uh, water steel axes, cheap foods, and money. Obviously, you'll be looting every hut in the village, but these aren't really worth going out of your way for if you see one out and about. Next up, we have the Pitman Hut, or as I call them, the Furnace Huts. Uh, these are an average hut in my opinion. These are identified by the furnace on the outside. It's helpful to have at least one of these in the village, but they're not super exciting to loot otherwise. Uh, the chest can contain money, armor, ores, including adamantite, and very commonly pickaxes. Having a high chance of a pickaxe is a big deal in the early game, so make sure you're not skipping these. Now we've got the Fletcher's Hut. This one has a fletching table attached to it and is arguably the second most useless hut in the game. The only notable loot would be ropes, a wooden axe, or a very small amount of iron bars. To me, the main use of these is the actual fletching table itself. Uh, getting one of these for free means you don't have to collect flint or birchwood to craft one. Uh, these are worth looting early game in a village, but aren't really worth your time after that. These fletching tables are used to craft uh, flax fibers, which are used in the sail of the boat, and you craft them using the flowers. So if you have enough flowers and you come across the fletching table, you can just come in and craft everything you need. And if you don't, you can actually break this apart with a rock or an axe and carry it with you. The number one most useless hut, in my opinion, is the chef's hut, or the food hut as they call it. These have a cauldron outside and will have an array of food related items in their chests, notably wheat and bread, uh, with also a very low chance of raw meat. Like the Fletcher's hut, these are worth looting if they're in your early game village, but don't waste your time if these are all by themselves. They're rarely worth your time. My favorite hut, the Smith hut or anvil hut, is designated with an anvil outside. Possible chest contents include, but are not limited to, coal, iron, gold, or mithril bars, money, armor, even up to an addy chest piece, and mid-tier swords or axes. These are great huts, in my opinion, because if you get a large stack of gold ores, you can turn right to the anvil and craft all your extras into money. Additionally, you can receive free armor or the means to craft some mithril armor, 
which allows you to negate almost all of the damage from the guardian beams. Wrapping up the structures, we have the rarest of the huts, the looter's hut. The name is a bit ironic as there aren't any lootable items in these huts, but they do contain one to five free power-up chests of random rarity. These are identifiable from all the open chests thrown about the outside. Uh, if you do see a looter's hut anywhere near you, it can be definitely worth heading that way. If you get lucky and get some high tier chest, uh, you could be leaving with quite a, quite a few legendary power-ups. All right, let's go over the actual power-ups now. We'll start with the common rarity power-ups. In math tier, we'll start with blue pill, which gives you plus 10 shielding. We've got a red pill, which gives you plus 10 maximum health. We've got a Robin Hood hat, which increases your bow speed and damage. We've got Spoo Bean, which allows your hunger to drain slower. And then depending on the runner, Jetpack will either be in meh or in A tier. Uh, we'll leave it here for now. This allows you to jump higher. Some runners don't pick up Jetpack at all because they feel slower with it and others pick up a maximum of one jetpack because more time in the air means less stamina drain. Uh, no matter what you decide to do, do not pick up more than one jetpack because at some point your height becomes more detrimental to your speed. So uh, play around with jetpack yourself, form your own opinion and place it where you want. The common power-ups that we actually care about a little bit, uh, we'll start with A tier commons and starting off, we'll go with dumbbell. Dumbbell increases your base strength by 10%, which does apply to things like barrels and chief chests. So getting that early is relatively helpful, but it's not like game changing. We've got broccoli, also an A tier. It regenerates your health over time. And while it's not super important because you have food and you have other power-ups that can regenerate health, being able to passively regenerate while you're walking around is pretty helpful. The last three of the common power-ups, I personally am going to put all in S tier. We've got orange juice, which increases your attack speed, peanut butter, which reduces your stamina drain while sprinting or jumping, and sneakers, which just increases your movement speed. Um, sneakers could really go A or S, honestly. Uh, any three of these, or any of these three, if you stack multiple on top of each other, the difference in your stats is pretty amazing. Getting two or three orange juices is an, an incredible buff, and that's the reason I put the, that up here in S tier. Peanut butter, again, stamina, as we went over earlier, is super important in this game. So being able to jump more times per stamina bar uh, just gives you more free reign of the of the map. And sneakers are self-explanatory. Uh, the faster you go, the faster you can do a speed run. Now let's move on to the rare tier power-ups. And all of them are useful uh, in a speed run, except for one of them. Uh, that would be the bulldozer. We'll put that in trash tier. Avoid this at all costs. It grants you a knockback ability, and all that means during a speed run is that you hit a boss and it can go out of range of your weapon, which obviously you don't want. Uh, if this power-up gets dropped by a boss, you'll, you might have to pick it up because you have to also grab the items that they drop. Uh, but if you open a chest with this in it, try not to grab it. Moving on to the meh tier of the rare rarity power-ups. We've got Danny's Milk, uh, increases your defense, something that's not super noticeable, but you know, a defense is never a bad thing. Uh, we've got Dracula, which gives you plus one max HP per kill. It's useful if you get it early on in a run because it does add up over time and will even proc on things like cows. So by the end of the run, you've got like 170 HP or something like that. It doesn't make a massive difference, which is why it's in Mets here, but it's, definitely noticeable moving up to the a tier for the rare power-ups we have janix frog um, you could argue that it's just meh but there's a, cer a certain little thing we can do with this i'll explain later um, it gives you plus one jump so essentially having one frog gives you a double jump having two frogs will give you three jumps in the air etc uh, etc et uh, again i'll go over this little trick later on at the end of the video but it does have its use and isn't trash, that's for sure. Next up in A tier for, un for the rares, we have Juice that increases your attack speed after you land a critical hit, and that pairs nicely with the Horseshoe, which increases your critical hit chance. So when you've got these as a pair, they work very well, and you'll get a lot more crits, which means your attack speed will go up more often. 
As far as S tiers in the rare uh, power ups, we've got Crimson Dagger, which is plus one health regen per hit, and Piggy Bank, which gives you um, increased loot drop from enemies. Crimson Dagger will make you essentially invincible as you'll be attacking fast enough to regenerate health before you can get hit by bosses more than once. Uh, you can still die, obviously, like to Gronk Swords and stuff like that if you're not careful, but getting a dagger is a huge buff in the speedrun. Piggy Bank can be argued as the most important power-up in the entire game. Uh, it makes everything that drops from an enemy have a chance to include more items, which also means you can get more money per kill. Uh, a single Piggy Bank could be the difference between getting uh, 11 rubies, which is what you need for the boat, uh, from a Guardian kill, and getting 6. That's not necessarily exactly how it works, but that kind of gets the point across. Having a piggy bank early on means your your money is just going to be easier to get. Your random drops are going to be better, and you have a better chance to get the amount of items that you need from drops. Last but not least, we've got the legendary power ups. Uh, in Met here, we'll start with a nuts hammer. Hammer doesn't really make a difference in the speed run. Uh, because I think the things that are actually weak to lightning spawn later uh, in later days. But since we're going fast, we'll never run into those. So there's a nice AOE effect that happens when the lightning procs, but it's not anything super crazy useful, which is why it lands in meh. Next up, we've got the checkered shirt. Uh, this grants you extra damage to resources. This is only really helpful if you get it super early in a run because both barrels and chests are considered resources. So getting the power up will increase the amount of damage you do to them. Uh, allows you to break barrels in just a couple of hits. Allows you to break chief chests in no time. Um, and if you are missing an ore trade, you can actually buy a pickaxe and go mine an ore far quicker than you were than you'd be able to without the shirt. Last up in this here, we've got Enforcer. This power up gives you a damage boost based on how fast your character is going. Uh, it's one of my least favorite power ups, just because it doesn't seem noticeable in the speed run. Um, most of the time when we're fighting bosses, we're just strafing around in a circle. And while you are technically moving, it's not really fast enough to make a noticeable difference in your damage. Sure, if you have a bunch of, of sneakers and you're uh, bunny hopping down a hill and you hit an enemy, you'll do massive damage. But in terms of a speed run, it, it doesn't add enough to make it an A or S tier. Uh, moving up to A though, we've got Sniper Scope. Uh, which gives you a really low percent chance to do a ton of damage. The only reason that Sniper Scope isn't S tier for speedrunning is that the damage boost cannot be applied to the final boss. Otherwise, getting a Sniper Scope early in a run and getting some luck with your RNG uh, could literally save you a minute or more. It allows you to one-shot a boss with a spear, uh, which is just crazy. Berserk is similar to Enforcer, uh, but the difference is that you'll likely be at a lower health more often than you'll be moving quickly uh, while you fight. The damage boost, again, isn't super noticeable, but it's still more useful in the speed run because you'll be at lower health more often than you're running. The last two legendaries we have are both going to be in S tier. We've got the Wings of Glory, which give you more damage if you hit an enemy while you're falling. Uh, it's a little, it's tricky for me to grade because they're incredibly powerful, but can definitely be complicated and make your fights a little more difficult, especially if you're just learning the game. Uh, if you have a spear, so you're quick switching to attack, it may be tough for you to learn how to also incorporate jumping and timing your swings so they're occurring in the downward fall uh, while you're fighting. So you could do super high A tier, but definitely for a, an experienced runner, S tier is probably accurate. And last but not least, we have Adrenaline. This power-up procs every unique time that your health falls below 30% and grants you insane attack speed, insane movement speed, and insane stamina boost. Since we know it procs at 30% of our health, uh, we can actually keep ourselves right around like 40 health because 30 would be 30% of our max. And if we let a boss hit us and bring us below 30 health, we know that we're gonna get a massive boost in our speed, uh, attack speed and movement speed. So we can kill the boss real quickly and then take off to the next boss. And it, it's, I will show a clip of how adrenaline works because it is pretty insane.
All right, now that we've got all the basics down, we know how to move around the map, we know how to deal with bosses, we know how to utilize villages, and we know what power-ups we want, we can finally walk through how you generally want to start a run. Uh, set your difficulty to easy, and make sure the version on the top left is visible in your capture software, and then click start. Um, I'm actually going to talk through my current PB run that I've uh, submitted to speedrun.com, uh, and I'm gonna just kind of go over exactly what you're looking for. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain how to do an actual run the best I can. So here's me resetting with my macro, and I get super lucky. Uh, I spawn directly in a village that's on a boat. This is literally the best kind of spawn you can get. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, go check the gem map because obviously I'm not gonna run this if the gems are trash. Grab the rock there, just uh, be ready to break some barrels. And I do this little, it's not really a glitch, it's, it's just more like a trick where you don't have any wood to build the ladder. So you can kind of do like a sideways jump and then spam spacebar and you can clip onto the side of the boat here. You can do that from any height really. And there's a, uh, somehow a pavilion on the boat. So I checked the gem map there, I guess I do. So I do things pretty quickly because I've you know played hundreds of hours. All right, so I'm checking the map here and the guardians aren't fantastic. Generally, you want them to be a lot closer to the boat, uh, but the grouping's not bad. Uh, as you can see, the, the four on the left here uh, are really close together. The red one is kind of a bummer, but I mean, this is why it wasn't a fantastic run, but this is for me, it was something runnable. So I just, I, I open my map really quick just to see where they're at. If they're terrible gems, just restart. So we're breaking our barrels, quick switching with the rock, because I don't have an ax yet. And I'm moving while I inventory, as I mentioned before. We get an ax here. So I'll move, be moving and I'll just switch the ax into my quick switching spot. I'm going to start smelting iron right now just because of, it's there and I was already at a furnace hut. So I see the fight. I see a, an iron guy, a wood guy, a white pants. And I check trades really quick too. I can see this has all the woods we need because I all like, like I said, you just check for five woods, then you know you've got it all. Check him. He's only got Ruby, so I make a note of that, obviously, but it's not terribly important. I don't know what that uh, was for there, but I'm gonna go break the cheap chest now. This is not great village looting, but it's always different when you spawn in a village on a boat. It, it's, you, you have to play it a little more aggressively, if that makes sense. So here I'm like, I'm really hoping I get a spear. If I get a spear here, then then the way I play this is, is way different, but we don't. Get some money, get some bread. We dropped that chest out of here. Check for purple soup. He does have it. Again, that's really the only thing I ever checked them for. Uh, we checked the iron guy. He's got Addy or rubies and an Addy sword. So we know we're going to have to buy this Addy sword. So what do we do to get the money? I actually don't even remember. But I see a chunk in the distance and I know I have a pickaxe. So I can go get some easy money there. Uh, we pick up the flowers because they're directly in our path. I'm eating this food to keep my stamina up, which you can barely see at the bottom of the screen there. And then we just uh, quick switch while we jump. As you can see, all the damage numbers are yellow because the picks do more damage against the chunk. And even though this is just a regular wood pickaxe, we, you know, kill them pretty quick. We get an insanely low rock drop. I didn't notice that. Six rocks from a chunk is crazy. But 27 iron and 117 gold is very good. So we'll head back here. I'm pretty sure I'm just going to buy uh, Addy Ore and the sword. And I imagine I'll be building a furnace here. Two more. We're going to put the iron in to finish that off. And then we're going to put the Addy in. Uh, right here, when you're putting stuff in, you can't right click up into like the, the fuel and the metal spots here for some reason. You Or like shift click. You have to manually put them there. But if you grab a stack and then right click, you drop one at a time. So I grab five, uh, I grab the wood stack and then put five wood in there because that's one wood per ore or per smelt. Uh, coal does two smelts per single core uh, coal. So 
you know it's great to have coal but don't ever go out of your way for coal you, there's usually so much wood that it, does, it doesn't matter to use wood Let's see more flowers i'm just checking the map uh, that's one thing that's kind of important is checking the map to make sure you're going the right way it is super easy to get turned around uh, when you check the map the arrow is pointing in the direction that you're looking and if you're doing uh you know bunny hops where you're walking diagonally a bit then it's going to be um you think you're going the right way or something but you're actually going off at a 45 degree angle so just you'll notice i pretty constantly check the map uh, i see a chief to the left here i'm gonna spawn that and try to kill it i don't have enough um i didn't have the money to buy purple soups so i'm not going to do a chief boost at this time i'm also pretty close to the red gem so it's not that important but we get a uh, a big drop 17 dark oak and the ancient core which is super important 17 dark oak saves me um three entire purchases of dark oak so we're already at the red i'm lining myself up to be facing towards the uh, other guardians i know it's like super small minute detail but you saw me check the map real quick there so i'm checking the map i know i'm facing towards the bottom of the map so i'm going to align myself so that i'm facing the direction i need to go when i finish this guardian kill uh, like i said super minute little things that i think about they're not really important because i could just check the map afterwards and go that direction but this way i know i just have to head straight at, uh, straight in front of me after i kill this guardian kill him i always make sure check the top left make sure i got the gem or i open the map afterwards and uh notice if the gems on the map still Ooh. all right so we get lucky enough that we just run into a village on their way to the next uh guardians this guy sells obamium and weird soup so i immediately buy the obamium since it's the last ore i need i'm just checking chests real quick notice i'm not breaking barrels because like i mentioned they're not worth the time sink once you have like a run going looking around free chests close enough for me to grab i get lucky with uh, an attack speed boost seven fur is nice just a bunch of wood in that uh building there i've got one entire stack of wheat which is perfect don't need to get any more of that we see a wood guy here we're gonna check no good trades uh dark wick from him and we're gonna try to get some food here we luckily have purple soup uh depending on how far in your run you are uh will kind of determine how much soup you want to buy i bought 40 that's probably a little much but I generally always kill too many bosses. Like that's just kind of a bad habit of mine. So I'll have the extra money in theory. I think I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking for the chief chest. So uh, I mentioned, I think briefly during the village section, this chest, this entire village is done for me. I bought the Obamium. There was no wood that I needed to buy because I know I have all the wood at that first village. Uh, as long as you know where you can buy things, like this village is useless. So I know the chief chest has money and bread, so I'm just gonna take that because there's no point in not doing it. It also allows me, wow, why are there a thousand goblins here? It allows me to kill the villagers who can also give me extra iron and gold. And they're like not a threat. You can usually one or two shot all of them with a, a, a sword. So you can see I just get a huge, uh, just a bunch of gold from that. Really the only reason I did it. Um, so here, as I'm moving stuff around, I'm also like, trying to take note of how much i have of everything obviously i keep the the three collectibles in the bottom right in my hotbar so i can always see that so i know i've got all the flowers we need all the wheat we need obviously I need more meat but i uh i'm checking this so i need gold bars i need nine so i know i i need two more iron uh gold ore i've got plenty of flint for the fletching table and then we can still buy wood once we get to the end here but i'm just i'm looking at that making sure I've got what I need. I know I need four more rocks to finish the boat. We'll see what I do next here. This is on the way. Like I mentioned, jack huts really aren't worth going out of your way for. This is literally in my in my path. I got lucky, 40 gold. It's really high drop for, for a random chest like that. But watch uh, this purple soup. It does almost an entire half stamina bar, which is why it's so uh, like the best thing to have for a speed run. If I'm not mistaken, I'm going after the southernmost guardian. Let me see if I can get there. Okay. So 
So my the Red Guardian was somewhere on the right middle of this map, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, I could have gone straight over to blue since it is the shortest path. But doing it this way is actually shorter in the long run, trying to go furthest away and then working my way in. Coming here and then having to go all the way out to pink and then going all the way back is just a longer distance. Um, it uh, It's probably noticeable. Realistically, now that um, the ground clip is a thing, I could have gone to blue, started... Uh, Oh my gosh, this would have been genius. If I had gone to blue and started um, the Obami smelting, I could have killed all these and then ground clipped from pink. It would have put me almost directly on that furnace. Yeah, that would, that would have been a great play. Uh, one of those small instances where ground clip would have been actually useful. But I, I can't remember if this was before I learned about ground clip. I think it was. So I see cows there, but they're not really... Oh, I do go for him. Okay. I probably saw that free chest and figured I might as well. They need nine more, nine more meat. You can generally find plenty of cows, if, especially if you're traveling a, a long distance. Um, so don't go too far out of your way for them. Get lucky with the stamina there. So that little map check there was one, checking to make sure I'm getting close to the Guardian and two, seeing if I need to do a Gronk boost. So obviously I'm too close to the Guardian to boost, but I'm keeping the Gronk alive so I can use him to do a Gronk boost. Um, just notice, notice I have the wings up here, which is more damage while you're falling. So I'm jumping while I attack this uh, since I've gotten that. I'll do some damage here just to... I'm already there. You might as well do some damage to make him easier to kill later. I switched to the bread because I got really low health there. And since the purple soup doesn't do much health, uh, I switched just to make sure I'm I'm topped off there. Then I switch right back to the soup. Some terrible jumps, some terrible, terrible jumps. There's another Gronk here. I think I probably end up killing the other Gronk after this Guardian is my guess. Okay, remember, stand very close. I don't take much damage from the beam. Still jumping. That was a pretty quick kill. Yep, I do. I do kill the Gronk. Yeah, my power ups are very good. I got sniper scope a little too late in the run to be super useful. I don't even know if it procs once, honestly. I see a village. I don't know. Oh, that's not a. Yeah, it is, it is. I don't know if I go to this village. I probably do. Again, switching to bread because my health is getting dangerously low. Jumping to make sure I'm using the wings properly. Uh, that's a perfect example of not getting too greedy. Um, I have 37 health. I see a Gronk coming. Uh, the Guardian's doing an attack. Jump away. Heal up real quick and then go back in. It's easy. It's better to save your run than it is to take just a couple points or um, it's better to save your run than die trying to uh, go hero mode on the last 30 HP. There we go. So I noticed here I didn't grab the gem. See how easy it is to miss that. Thankfully, it is just sitting right there for me. I can't miss it on the way back. Uh, all we got all the wo oak wood we needed from that Gronk. We get the rest of our gold ore that we need, which is perfect. At this point, I don't need anything but rubies and wood, which I have from the main village. So I'm not sure what I'm doing here, to be honest. Looks like I could have saved myself from some time. Just making sure I'm, I have the wood here for some reason. Okay, it's a good question. VOD review is what they would call it. And I'm just making mistakes. But if we get rubies there, okay. There's no okay, there's no point in coming to this village. At this point, I should know that I have everything I need at that village on the boat. So why am I wasting my time here when I can go straight to the boat, build my furnace for the Obamium, and then buy all my stuff? That's one of those uh, other optimizations you can do. Because right now, I need five Obamium bars, and Obamium takes a long time to smelt. So wasting time here is actually wasting extra time because now I have to wait for the Obamium while I'm doing maybe nothing. The, the last thing you want to do 
is to um, be smelting and only waiting for the smelting. Ideally, you find your Obamium and Addy at your first village and you can build your furnaces on the boat or in that village. And then your smelting is done while you're fighting guardians, which obviously I did that with the Addy and the iron at the beginning of this run. But since Obamium wasn't at the first village, I had, you have to make some adjustments. Um, I went there to look for, uh, are we, do I do bow strats? There's no way I do bow strats. So my inventory is completely full. So what I'm going to do now is craft my fletching table and ropes to get some uh, space in my inventory or not ropes. Sorry, flax fibers, but it gets rid of my birch and my flint. I'll be careful not to hit these villagers, me. And I'm going to make my bark. I'm going to make more ropes. Okay, so I'm freeing up some space. I do buy a bow. So I, I said I'm not going to talk about this. I said I'm not going to talk about the bow in the tutorial, but here we are. Uh, I have a ton of extra gold. I don't even have a ton of extra gold. What am I thinking here? This this run could have been so much better. Holy cow. I'll need to kill another boss if I buy the bow. Uh, I guess we'll talk about it. If you buy an ancient bow, the only bow that's worth uh, buying in this game can also show up in the chief chest. I think it's like a 1% or 2% chance. Uh, incredibly powerful shoots three arrows at once uh, if you do you need to buy like fire arrows water arrows or i think they're lightning arrows those are really the only three that do big damage to the final boss trying to use for like none of these can even reach the boss they don't shoot strong enough and the other arrows don't do enough damage to make it worth buying you know a 250 gold uh bow so you see me buy a bunch of arrows and then i have to throw the arrows up into here so it frees up an inventory slot so I can pick up the bow. It's just a mess. Like single player inventory management is very, uh, very tough. But at this point of the run, you don't need your axe. You don't need your pickaxe. So I just throw those away. So I've got two more spots to play with if I need to. Get no, well, there's a sniper scope coming in handy for once. What am I doing? I legitimately have no clue what I'm thinking in this. Oh, I'm getting more gold. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, see, look at that. That is why you check your map after guardian kills. I didn't even realize that was missing. Your inventory will fill up sometimes and you won't notice it and you won't grab your, your gems. I think that's probably what happened here. Uh, I'm killing these guys for gold. Don't really need to, I think, because I'm going to sell the guardian left. I, it looks like if I'm remembering correctly, I only need to buy three more oak or dark oak. Yeah, it looks like it. So we need 28. Unfortunately, I'm one short of only having to buy two. There's our orange juice attack speed boost coming in. Getting knocked back from the goblins. That's just fantastic. All right. We got piggy bank on the last boss, which is the worst timing for piggy bank. And I now it's just a mad dash to the boat. I still have to build a furnace. I have to or not to build. It. I have to smelt the bombium and my gold ore still. This is a very like looking back on it. It's just a very not great run. Obviously, it's still, you know, 50, 15 minute runs. Not great, but it's fine but just seeing all the mistakes i've made i probably could have easily been a, something in the 14s and it wasn't it wasn't great guardians uh again these close guardians are a big deal using ground clip would have made this far better a lot of, a lot of things that we could we could have done okay so this is smart of me and this is what you should do since since i made the mistake of waiting till now to smelt um split your obamium or your addy up because it does take so long that it makes a difference doing three and a two instead of all five and one so then i'm just gonna throw the gold in there because uh five coal is enough to do 10 gold or you know 10 smelts of anything i'm gonna top off the dark oak i think get the last one there and then we go to repair the boat Just spam E as long as you've built. So as long as you've crafted your ropes and I think uh, ropes and flax fiber, 
If you have all your materials, all you do is just smash E on everything and you should be fine. Don't forget that there are two ladders, one on either side. That can trip people up sometimes. It's weird with that pavilion on here, but I don't think it end up, ends up mattering. Uh, there can be two holes in the back of the boat there. That's what I was checking for. I don't know. I mean, I just got to go to the furnaces now, wait for the Obamium. See, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm done with the boat and I have to come back here or I could have been waiting still a little bit. But we're done now. We're going to go up here, place the last of the materials. And then click the steering wheel to leave at 1333. Uh, so this is a little tip. If you finish and you have like I have 196 gold. The boss takes, I don't know exactly how long, at least like 30 or 40 seconds to spawn. You can, especially if you've got the food to do it, come out, uh, get off the boat. Well, I go to buy arrows. That's kind of smart too. So you can buy arrows, you can buy a bow, or you can open chests. So keep that in mind. So now you're just, I'm getting set up for the boss kill. Um, the bow is, I think the, the fastest way to kill it, even if you have a spear, if you can hit your shots, that is. Which I, this is probably my first ever run using the bow on Bob. So, I mean, I must have done well enough since I got a PB, so. Uh, the big key is you have to aim super far ahead and super high up. It's, it's hard to, you can't practice this because it's, there's no real creative mode. There's no way to just try Bob by himself. Just see, like, so I had to aim way up left of him flying in the left direction. I still missed that one. So I waste a lot of arrows. There you go. There we go. Okay, so let me explain how Bob works a little bit. I, I don't know every single detail. Uh, Eclipse does know every single detail. But he'll perch just like in Minecraft. I'll talk about it when, when he perches, I guess. So he flies around from anywhere from there we go. He flies around from anywhere like 14 seconds to a minute 30. It's the RNG is crazy. Um, you saw him take a very, very sharp turn. So his perches are usually super obvious because if he's not flying in the direction, he'll always perch on this the side of the boat over here. He'll take like an immediate hard turn. That's when I know he's perching and then he'll come and land right here. Uh, so what he leaves so when he unperches it's going to be at one third of his health so i bring up the calculator here so 29.95 divided by three and then times two so that's two thirds of his health 1997 so when his health reaches 1997 if he had full health that is when he would leave um and it's always going to be one third of his max health so even though he's weak right now that's one third of his health. So I know that from 1509, once he takes 998 damage, he will unperch. So 1509 to uh, minus 998. So when his health bar reaches 511 health left, that is when he will unperch. So this is a little complicated kind of advanced strategy. Uh, what you want to do is wait for certain attacks that he can do because there are uh, two attacks that are a lengthier animation and he can't leave during an, uh, during an attack. So I'm gonna get him down. Well, I, I don't know what I do in this run, but ideally I get him down to just over 511. So I would get to like 550, 600, give yourself some leeway because you don't wanna make any mistakes and quick mental math can be, you know, a little shaky. Uh, so get him down to 600 health, wait until he does the fireball attack, which is longest attack. And you should have a plenty of time to finish this health bar before he can uh, take off. So I'm switching my arrows. We're just using the bow here because it is technically stronger with the with the arrows that I've got. He does that slam attack. So he goes to the side and just sweeps across. All you have to do is jump over his arms or, or the fire. Okay, this is his fireball attack. It's when he raises his head straight up. So I don't even stop attacking because I... I recognize this as his fireball attack and I just, I want to get him dead. All you have to do is avoid those little targets and you're good. The only other attack, um, he does two more attacks actually. 
one is he just slams his hand on the ground uh doesn't do a whole ton it's not that bad uh the other one is his flame breath and he'll turn his head towards you and spray you with fire and if you're not careful that can just literally delete you if he does the fire breath attack you may want to kind of move to a little safer location or if you've got like um the crimson dagger or a couple of them you could probably tank it no problem a lot of this de depends on your power-ups a lot of it depends on your weapon 99 out of 100 times you will not have the bow so you'd be up close and personal and it's the same exact thing as by beating any other boss just kind of strafe side to side as you attack them uh, don't stop attacking if you have wings make sure you're jumping to do the extra damage um, but all of the the one-third health thing applies no matter what you're doing uh, you see i typed slash seed got my seed and that is a whole run of muck well, now that we've covered all the basics of Muck speedrunning, it's time to get some runs together for yourself. As I stated earlier, there are so many different things that could come up in any given run, and there'll be things you'll learn as you watch other people do runs or just by playing the game yourself. If you do have any questions, comments, or additions, please feel free to join the Muck speedrunning Discord, which will be in the description. Uh, the most knowledgeable runners are usually very active, including Cl Eclipse, Zaffy, and myself, uh, and they're always willing to discuss strategy or answer any questions that you might have. Uh, feel free to comment on this video if you don't want to join the Discord. I'm sure somebody will get to you. Uh, thanks for your time and your desire to learn how to speedrun Muck. I hope you have fun uh, in your learning adventure. Just don't beat my time, please. All right, so we finished all of the main parts of the tutorial, and you've come looking for little bonus tips and tricks. These things are uh, little time savers or more advanced tricks. I don't know. They're just random stuff that didn't really fit in the tutorial. Uh, we're going to start off with the ground clip. Uh, ground clip was always kind of known about. Uh, it was rarely happening when a chunk would like jump on top of you and sometimes it would just push you under the map. I think it's only happened to me in runs maybe maybe four times. Since this ocean is actually, uh, it actually exists everywhere on the entire map, there is water underneath the ground here. So if we clip under the actual you know, grass part, that we can swim to locations and swimming as you know is uh pretty quick or if you swim straight down until you hit the barrier like the kill barrier it'll actually teleport you down to like zero zero or whatever the coordinates would you would call 50 50 on the map this is a pretty niche trick and there aren't many circumstances where it would be actually usable and for it to be usable you'd actually have to be pretty proficient at it for example if i wanted to travel from my location here to yellow I would have to be able to do the trick and swim there in less time it would than it would take me to just walk there. So I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. So like I said, not always applicable. Most of the time, if it is used, will be for teleporting to center. For example, if we found a village near the center, what we could do is set up all of our furnaces and everything and then go finish off these gems in the bottom right or something. Then we'll perform the ground clip, teleporting us right back to near that village uh, saving us the travel distance from the bottom right of the map. To perform ground clip, you need regular wood walls and regular wood stairs. Uh, just a forewarning, I am not super f proficient in this. I haven't done really any practice. Eclipse and Zaffy are far better. Uh, and if you need more tips, please join the Discord and ask them because they know a lot more. Uh, I do know that going downhill is a little easier than going uphill, but you can do it anywhere. So place your wall, rotate twice to get a 90 degree angle. And uh, you want the angle for like an arrow pointing down the hill. Select your staircase and walk backwards into the corner and hold S this whole time and rotate the stairs so it's facing you like this. Watch the top step. And when it's over your head, right click to place it. And you'll see our, our body move down just a little bit and there's another clip. And now we'll place the stair on top of our head again. And again, keep holding S. And this is actually pretty good. We should be able to get pushed under the map here. Sometimes it takes a little while. Sometimes it takes a third staircase. Or a fourth. Like I said, I am not uh, very practiced in this or very good. Zappy and Eclipse can get it pretty reliably in two stair placements. So use that as a reference for how quick it can be. But now we're under the map. Uh, if we want to travel to yellow, we just look towards yellow and we swim. Uh, reminder, you do need food for this because you will be losing stamina. This is obviously a creative mode just for uh, example purposes. 
you can use this as a, as a strategy to like scope out bosses like we saw a chunk right to our right over there uh, you can look for villages further away without trees blocking your like right there's a village there's a few small uses other than just the teleporting you technically can uh, also spawn bosses from underneath if you can reach their statue so if you go down and get a little momentum i don't think i've ever so that was really close he might be too up too high to do this for but you can uh, if you want to exit this all you have to do is find like, like a beach because that's low enough that you can literally just cliff right back through the ground or you can uh do this little jump if it's shallow enough just jump up into the land i would definitely just look for water though it's definitely the easiest and just to showcase the teleport we are on the yellow gem there i'm just gonna swim straight down and here we are at the direct center of the map so obviously this teleport isn't huge but if we needed to go back to boat and we're on the opposite corner of the map being able to clip and teleport from there saves a bunch of time speaking of niche tricks we actually have a weird method in which we can block the beam from the guardian as we know the the beam can be pretty dangerous you can't always reliably block all the damage from standing closer unless you have uh, armor obviously but there's a strategy that involves dropping items one by one so you take the uh, the stack of items rocks are pretty simple to do it with right click on the outside of the inventory and you see it drops one by one and we'll just kind of hope it blocks the beam there's nothing really else to it okay well, that was pretty good i didn't think i was doing that right but we barely took any damage so perhaps that was correct I've never actually utilized this before. I didn't realize it was... Well, I always... I regularly forget things like this. Oh, yeah, look at that. Pretty cool. One of our other tips and tricks is if you have this hole on the right side of the boat here that lines up with this uh, staircase you haven't built yet, usually it's high off the ground. Obviously, this boat is clipping into the ground a little bit. But it's very difficult to get to because if you want to craft it you have to jump off the edge you can't reach it from here so what you do instead before you build the stairs for 15 fur you can actually access the hitbox for that hole from inside so you'll see especially in like eclipses runs he'll come up here hit this and then hit that uh you do it pretty quickly it doesn't require you to jump off the boat for it just another little bit of a time save there I've talked about some of the uh, weird inventory things where like you can't shift click certain things, but you can others. One of the other strange inventory things I wanted to cover was when you can craft with right and left clicking. Uh, so if you have gold bars in your inventory, which you often will, if you have a, an anvil chest or, a, or an anvil hut, sorry, we need nine only. So I wanna, if I had 69, I would want to change 60 of these gold bars into gold. One gold bar is coins, five coins, yep. So instead of left clicking, you can actually right and left click alternatively or alternatingly, whatever you wanna say. And since you'll really never have more than like 15 at the very most, just doing that really quick is a nice way to, to craft that gold instead of trying to uh, quickly click, click with one finger. And, and then same goes with the collection table and the flowers when you're crafting your flax fibers you can just craft your 13 and go okay this is the end for real goodbye